Okay, we are joined by Brian Beijing and Dave Stoltz. How are you guys today? Excellent. So, so I'm doing fantastic. It's a pleasure to talk to you. I know there's so much information that you can offer our viewers about what you do and, and, and you know, the information you've gleaned. Now, give us an idea of how this all started, you know, what in your background led you to do what you do and then meet Dave and combine forces? Um, my background, well, what led me to do it originally was just being terribly shy mm -hmm. and uh, not being able to talk to people. I couldn't yeah. stand it. It made me miserable. And when I got out of high school, I was so antisocial. I was basically uh -huh. agoraphobic. It means I didn't want to leave the house. Yeah. I was so antisocial, I realized that if I didn't make a major change in my life, that I was going to be alone and miserable when I got old. And, um, and I wasn't going to have a lot of friends. And I saw that in some of the people in my family, and I, I didn't want to be like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I set out on a lifelong journey of learning and mm -hmm. studying. I read every book I could get my hand on, on, on social skills, on pe connecting on people, on understanding my own emotions and connecting with my own emotions. I became, at some point, I became a hypnotherapist and mm -hmm. started practicing in that for a bit. And then I got into, uh, I moved into a yoga community for a year and lived in this crazy, wild, yoga community where creativity was like it was uh, um, was completely encouraged to live outside the box and take risk and uh, that was an amazing year of my life and then uh, eventually uh, I was really working on the dating side of my life because I had started to become more confident but I still wasn't dating uh, women I, I was interested in. I was, uh, yeah, at best I was I was getting women that chased me but I was but I was too scared to go out and ask any girl I really liked out and um, what ended up happening was fascinating. I, I fell in love with the first girl that, that I liked. I really liked this girl and I was like, wow, she's amazing. I'd never found a girl like her before because I was really working on myself. We broke up two months later, went into a mad depression <laughs> and uh, that began the, the real work, I always say. At that point was the point of the real work when I committed my whole life every my career, my, the way I make money to this work, and uh, I've had mentors and teachers ever since, and we started a, a, I started a workshop business really helping men step into their, their power as men. Not to go out, and, and this is the key, we wanted to help men have a, a more powerful lifestyle, learn to love themselves, to be able to get amazing women in their life, but mm -hmm. not get women for the sake of getting women. Yeah. First, it's like get women because you're powerfully confident and you love yourself. Not get women just to get laid. And uh, and I said, if you just want to get laid, we're not, we're not the company for you. Yeah. If you want to feel powerful and deserving of having an amazing woman in your life and have an amazing lifestyle, then we can help you. But that's deeper work. That's a lot deeper work than the other one. So uh, that's how Fearless was born. Amazing. And then uh, in uh, two, three years ago, I met Dave. Yeah. I'm introduced by a friend, and I'll let him take it from there. Yeah. Yeah, my, my background is completely different than Brian's, like polar opposites. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I was a, a young kid, I, at 18 months, I climbed over my parents' fence and was, like, running through town and just yeah. always on some kind of adventure. And um, I always wanted more in my life. And, you know, agoraphobia, like Brian was talking about, like, didn't, didn't even register with me. Um, was always very social and always outgoing, always getting myself in trouble and always exploring and, and seeing what's out there. So I had, I had always built uh, a natural confidence in the sense of getting myself in trouble than getting myself out. Mm -hmm. um, I had very masculine role models in my family. Um, I come from a very loving traditional family and um, so for them, as I was growing up, I was pushing some buttons for sure. But um, all of that stuff comes full circle because now it's enabled me to help other men um, and even women really take a lot of risk in their life and really go after what they want in their life mm -hmm. instead of being so afraid. Um, and I've always held a, a very clear vision of what I wanted in life and the lifestyle that I wanted to live. Whether I had money or didn't have money, I still allowed myself to go have those experiences because I felt that the experience in the end is worth more than than sitting there 
debating whether I could afford it or not. I never, never really let that hold me back. Sometimes it did, but I would always try to find a workaround. And even if I got a, a small portion of that experience and then later expanded on it when I had more money to do so, that's, that's what I had done. And I kind of got into coaching not because I ever wanted to be a coach. Uh, I kind of just got pulled into it um, through friends who were asking, like, how are you doing all this stuff? Um, I started as a dating coach in Washington, D.C., and I had a couple of private clients, and that was kind of starting to grow. And it was fun. I enjoyed it. But I've, I've always been drawn to how do you create the dream life, and we, we use that term a lot. Like how do you create your own dream life? Everybody has a dream, and everybody wants to live a certain way. A lot of people think that it is, unfortunately, just a dream, and that's not true. Um, what's true is what you believe to be and what you take action to make uh, come to fruition for yourself. And so that's what I've done. And again, you're going you're gonna to take a lot of risk. You're going to get in a lot of trouble, but in the end, it's worth it. Um, mm -hmm. So from the from the, the dating coaching in D.C., so to speak, uh, to uh, meeting Brian uh, in 2013 uh, through a girl I was, was dating here in, in L.A. Um, we, we started The Fearless Man, and we've helped grow uh, so many people's lives, not just from a dating perspective. Um, yeah. yeah, we're really, really good at teaching dating, really good, but what we mainly focus on is creating a powerful lifestyle and an authentic lifestyle for men. Uh, and, and we have worked with a lot of women who have also blown their own lives up to be greater than they ever thought they could. Um, so that's kind of where we are today is, sure, dating is just something we do. It's, it's just second nature and we can teach it like no problem in our sleep. What's really exciting now for us is helping uh, men create this amazing lifestyle and truly live their dream life, what they want it to be. So that's, uh, that's what we're doing today. And uh, I'm super passionate about it. I love doing it. And just like when I walked in here, Jay, it was, it saw all this, like instantly I knew like, here's a passionate man that like, this is what he's always wanted to do. And I mean, I love this place. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you're doing exactly what we're trying to help other men do. So you're a living example. Yeah. And I want to I want to add one piece because I think this this really kind of brings it together, and I want to almost start this talk by talking about death. And uh, I dated a girl many years ago, and we only went on one date, but she told me something really interesting. She was uh, she worked in hospice care where mm -hmm. people are dying, mm -hmm. and she was a physical therapist. And she said that um, she said that most of the people she worked with have, were filled with regret and were miserable, and and were were unhappy as they were dying and she said but every once in a while somebody would come through that was happy really happy and ready to go and ready to move on and pass away and they were content and she said it was always the same reason why those people were content they went after their dreams they lived a full life and all the people um, that were filled with regret played it safe did the secure logical thing and that's always stuck with me and when you look at Dave's life, he's never played it safe. You look at me, I've always stepped outside the box. I played more from the inner perspective. I always went inside to figure out what was going on, to change the outer. And he's played more on the outer to affect his inner. But, but, uh, but that's what life's about, you know? I mean, I could have a lot of money in the bank and security, or I could have a lifetime of adventures and stories. And, that, and if you really live your life the way you're meant to, you still have a lot of money, probably more. So, yeah, it kind of goes back just to kind of wrap this idea of sure. what we were talking about before the interview started. You know, you said you, you like I feel like I've lived five lifetimes because yeah. uh, you're so ingrained in your own lifestyle. And and when you said that, it really resonated with me because I feel the same way. It's like, I look back at what I've done. I can't even remember half of it. You know, mm -hmm. kind of like what you were saying. It's like did I just do that? Mm -hmm. uh, and I have friends that bring things up that I don't remember because. We've done so much in our lives that it's just like, oh yeah, we did do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, you know, every day's an adventure is the way I look at it. And <clears throat> as much as I can experience, as much as I can pack in that day, <clears throat> the better. <clears throat> One of uh, a real 
breakthrough moment for me was after coming up as a childhood, uh, living in a lot of places, moving around a lot and experiencing a lot, uh, I went to college and no one major really fit my mold. So I, I asked how could I create my own major and it was a year journey of actually having to go out and um, put it together, explain it to the heads of all the colleges on the campus and execute it. And I remember one of the classes, because I was trying to combine, you know, business and, and theater and music and marketing and broadcasting and, you know, all this stuff, is I had a, a broadcasting class and I had a fear of public speaking. I, the, I think there was only maybe 25 people in the room, but I've never been so scared in my life because we had to, as a project, write and actually speak in front of the, the crowd. I was always more of the introverted, creative person. I'd play my guitar, my music, and kind of drift, you know, into the background. So, <clears throat> forcing myself to give that speech to the class was the biggest breakthrough moment of my life. Because I realized, what's the worst thing that can happen? 20 people chuckle or, or the room <laughs> chuckles. Yeah. Your voice cracks. Yeah, <laughs> you, you know. Or what I realized is I, I broke through. Yeah. And then I started the radio show and then I became the concert promoter of the university and then I moved to Los Angeles and have done... So that class was a defining moment. That class was a defining moment. That brought you, that created it, your career. I broke through to the other yeah. side. It was this barrier like... Oh, I can never get up in front of that, that crowd and be the speaker, the front man, the, you know, the, um, the teacher, so to speak. And I just felt a complete breakthrough, and I loved it ever since. And that's when I went out and started interviewing all these artists and, and producers and, and people that were already doing what I wanted to do. And I felt more and more comfortable in that interaction, you know, with them. So... Um, it's it's endless. It Ever makes, since it's been a just a. An you adventure. remind me with that story of Jim Morrison singing on the stage backwards, you know, and he had to build up his confidence to be able to yeah. turn around and face the stage, yeah. and because uh, he he couldn't look at people while he was singing, you know, and that and I'm sure you know that story, yeah. but but uh, but that's exactly it. He got up there and it, and I'm, and the doors wouldn't be here today if he hadn't faced that fear. Yeah. yeah, so you had this quiet little poet, you know, with his back to the audience, <laughs> become one of the most yeah. iconic front men in the history of entertainment. Yeah, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And, and everybody that's looking for a takeaway from, from watching this, yeah. Jay just said it. It's the tiniest <laughs> little thing. It he is. faced his fear. He walked right through it, right to the other side. There's no going around it. you got to go straight through it yeah. and look at what it birthed. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's... I, you look at successful people and you realize they all failed and it's not the fact that they failed but they got back up and did it again and found a way around the challenge and they're still not afraid to fail so I have no no fear yeah. of failing that's why I would start something like the Indie Summit or something it's like how can I do this without a, a, a big backer and, and a big staff and all this but you realize that it's what people get out of it that yeah. keeps it going yeah. You know? and, and I would add to that and say that it, not only are you not afraid to fail, but you have, you realize at a certain point uh, as an entrepreneur that, that failure is essential to success. That yeah. you will have way more failures. You'll fail your way to the top. You'll fail your way to success. Because yeah. every failure is just a course correction. You correct, oh, course correct this way. It's like the, they say the space shuttle or the Apollo moon rocket, I think, was off course 97% of the time on the way to the moon. Mm -hmm. And all they did was course correct it back and forth they got it to where they wanted it to be and so what we become good at is failing better and better in fact correcting our failures faster and faster so when you drive down the street in a car you got to constantly course correct you go off the road but it reaches a point where you're course correcting so fast your car is going straight at least it looks that way to the naked eye and and that's what great entrepreneurs do is they learn to adjust faster and faster they don't yeah. fight the failures, they flow with them like a surfer on a wave. Yeah. And uh, you're going to get tons of them. That's the beauty. The, the failures are the excitement. They are the journey. 
Well, you probably learn more from a failure than you do a success. Oh, so, yeah. you, you know, there's no great sports team, championship, legacy, dynasty that didn't lose. Yeah. So, you know, it steps along the way. But, yeah, and, and then to learn from others' failures. That's what I do in a lot of the interviews is I study. Study successes is almost like going to interview people that won the lottery. You know, talking to the people that actually persevered and succeeded after many failures or, you know, toiling in the wrong directions um, is, is so much more enriching. Jeff Olson said, uh, he's a great, he's an author of The Slight Edge, a great book, but he said, uh, he said he was opening a new territory to start sales in, in a new country, and he said, I wasn't sure what to do because I didn't know much about the country, so I just decided I'm going to double my failure rate. If I double my failure rate, I should double my success rate. And so he went over there, not with the intent to double the success rate, but to, to get double the failures he normally gets, to double the no's. Yeah. And he became number one. He like took right off in that industry, in that, in that country. So it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Now, tell us a little bit about the, the curriculum, the programs, the, you know, the network that you've started and basically how you've arranged it to both, you know, feed what you're trying to do and, again, be the most effective for your target audience. Um, well, it, it originally started off as dating coaching, but it really became confidence coaching, success coaching. So that's really what we do now. Yeah. We help men become powerfully confident. We, um, a lot of people come to us through the YouTube channel. You know, the fearless man, uh, youtube.com slash the fearless man, which we put up two free videos a week. Of course, they're all free. There's tons of information on there. And that's, that's really where I tell people, just take a look at that and, and get a feel for whether this material resonates with you. And, um, and because right there, you can get tons of lessons and you don't even pay a dime. And um, I think we have like 140 some videos up there now. So mm -hmm. yeah, they, we put up two a week. But it gets the wheels turning. Yeah, for people to realize that there's yeah. we there's more out there. We believe in providing value and helping as many people as possible. Yes, we have exclusive programs for people who want to do that. But we also want to help the person that's around the world in another country that's say in Eastern Europe barely making a living. You know, and uh, we want him to be able to get get out there get some value too. Yeah, yeah. So, and then. And then we, looking at our, our data um, from people engaging, uh, the U.S. is known worldwide for its personal growth industry and that we're, we're at the cutting edge of it. And so everyone wants to come here to learn. So when we look at our data from our membership sites or our users, it's mostly outside of the U.S., which mm -hmm. is really interesting. Um, so a lot of the people here in the U.S. are, you know, obviously have much greater access to it and can come do live workshops where everybody else is searching online that is outside of the U.S. And, and I was talking to a couple of people in Europe and they're like, man, you guys got it down. Like, the U.S. is known around the world for its personal growth development programs because they're so good and mm -hmm. we've taken it so seriously, especially here in California. I mean, this is like the pinnacle of personal growth uh, mm -hmm. in, in the U.S. I mean, you go to other parts of the country, it's it's not as well known or widely as it accepted, but, you know, then again, we have more millionaires per capita here in California yeah. than anywhere else in the world, so, you know, that speaks for itself. And um, we're really proud of uh, a lot of our clients. Uh, a lot of them have achieved six-figure status, which is really, really cool. Um, mm -hmm. We kind of did a poll the other day, and we found out we had a lot more than we knew about. So mm -hmm. that was cool. Um, so you know, that's just financial success, which is is great. There's a lot more of other successes um, that we work on too. And um, talk about um, one of the one of the areas we're most proud about, and I'll let you elaborate on this because because uh, I know you love to talk about Alvin a little bit in one of the clients, and he's it, uh, it is. The physical health changes that we get, we get a lot right. of physical health changes. People with disabilities, problems that really change their lives. And, and um, I know he he works. He helped Alvin with a particular challenge he had. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, um, like this. This is what I love to do uh, when I have the opportunity, it, and it's really what was missing from my life. Like, the money wasn't that much of an issue in my life, but 
like feeling fulfilled, like I'd done something great for the day, is what I was missing. So that's kind of why I got into coaching because I had this this uh, need for fulfillment of my day, and um, coaching gave me that. And when we had a, a client come in, Alvin, um, he's not going to care that we use his name because he's, mm. he's he wants to be a, a self promoter anyway. So. Uh, yeah, I'm talking about you, buddy. But um, <laughs> he's got YouTube videos out there all over the place already. So, <laughs> so, so Albin comes to us. Um, he's 32 years old, hunched over in a walker. He has uh, CP, so cere cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of disheveled. Looks just like this old man, and he's 32 years old. He literally mm -hmm. looks. He reminds me of like Smithers from The Simpsons, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and. Mm -hmm. uh, I looked at this guy and I was like, "Why is this guy in a walker?" Like, just energetically, I could, I could see that he could walk. I just knew that he could. And he spent two and a half days in our introductory workshop with us, and I had him walking on the second day, with no walker for his first time ever, with just a cane. And he had walked 500 feet carrying his own lunch, which he had never done in his entire life. And now, a year later. He's walking with no cane and just completed a 5K. You know, he did that with his walker, but mm -hmm. still completed a 5K. And here's a guy that, you know, could barely walk. Um, so that's that's how deep and powerful the work can go that we do is, is taking someone that has never done something that all of us here take for granted mm -hmm. since we were born and now giving them the power and empowering them to take steps on their own. So it, it's it's been really amazing. Uh, it's been an awesome journey with him. He uh, he's gone skydiving with me twice now. So he's his life has just exploded beyond belief. And uh, he's uh, a client who has actually increased his income seven hundred percent since working with us. It's a huge increase. Yeah. And, uh, but I think more than the money, and he'll even say it himself, is that we've, we've opened him up and stripped away the, the victim mentality that he's had that had been holding him back and allowed him to access his own anger about his situation and express it. And that has really brought up a lot of power, a lot of masculine power in his own life for him to go out and start achieving all of this stuff in a matter of a year, year and a half. So, uh, I mean, we're very proud of that and that success, and, and I know he is too. He, he tells everyone about what, and we're, what we've done. I'll say yeah. this about Aubin, one simple thing, is he was open. He was, he was open to doing the work. Yeah. He got in there. He was consistent. He worked hard. He did it. We guided him. He did it, and uh, he killed it. And uh, it's that mentality and it's, it, yeah, it makes us, I mean, I can only I can see where he's going, and he's gonna outperform people that have never had a physical disability in their life. He already is, but he's gonna he's gonna I, I can see him easily being a multimillionaire, having all these amazing successes in his life, and it's all because he's doing the work. He's applying these these principles over and over and over again in his life, yep. and he, he's having fun doing it. So that's what the work's about. Yeah. That's yeah, amazing stuff. At the core level, yeah. Sure. And it, it's, it, you know, we talk about money a lot because people are obsessed with money. And, yeah. And uh, six figures is a huge thing for a lot of people. But at the core of the work, you know, who cares about the money if you can't walk? You know, right. If you're, you're laying in a bed or just sitting it's in a room. It's a byproduct world. of doing good work. Yeah. It's not the end goal. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not. You should be happy no matter what you're earning, but obviously... Finance can enable you to do more things you might sure. not be able have to afford. Greater experiences. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Money is essential. Have the time off. I had a mentor once. He's a multimillionaire, and um, and uh, he he really pointed out. He said money is essential to a healthy life. It's not it doesn't create happiness, but it's essential to be able to set yourself free so you can work on yourself, do the things you need to do, get to where you need to be. He saw it as important as oxygen or air. He says, not the amount, you got to get to an amount that you need for you. That might be 100,000, that might be 80,000, that might be a million. But you got to realize the ability to be able to manifest what you need when you need it is what's essential. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise yeah. you'll live in fear of, yeah. in, in scarcity. 
And life is not meant to be lived in scarcity. It's meant to be lived in abundance. Mm -hmm. And true entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs that succeed, get that. Mm -hmm. they, if, if you meet somebody that's created success in their life and you take everything away, they'll just go create more. Even at 60 years old, they'll go create more. They'll be like, I can go create more. I did it once, I'll do it again. And they do. Yeah. And um, then you I'm got the other. to start over. Yeah. yeah. You got the other people who are skimping and saving each dime, they get afraid and trying to protect it. And they're living life in scarcity and fear. And then when they lose it, they freak out. I had a guy call me like that. He'd saved his whole life into becoming a millionaire. Mm -hmm. During the housing bubble, he lost it all. And now he's 60 some years old and he didn't know how to get it back. He's like, I don't have enough time. He's freaking out driving uh, Uber and working at Home Depot. Mm -hmm. And freaking out because he's no, he, he doesn't have any money anymore. And I'm like, that sucks. He wasn't, he was, so he was living in a scarcity mentality trying to protect what he had. And that mm -hmm. fear caused him, that fear in his subconscious mind eventually uh, allowed him to lose it because what we think about we manifest. And then he didn't know how to get it back. Now he can, but he's got to change his thinking. I, I believe we, we are all capable of amazing things. Yeah. So the YouTube channel is going to give us an idea of some of the principles, some of the ideas, yeah. some of the attitude. Now talk about some of the, the courses, some of the training, some of the deeper things that once were obviously excited about Fearless. What can we get into from there? Awesome. Um, did you want to handle it? That's a, I mean, that's a great question. We both can talk about it. Um, I mean, the basic structure and the way we've structured the whole flow of things because of the work that we do is so intense um, and drums up a lot of emotion that people aren't used to handling, especially men. Uh, we start out with a basic introductory program. It's two and a half days. Um, we do those in L.A., in New York City, D.C. Um, we've done a couple in Vegas and then uh, in Europe as well. Mm -hmm. And then from there... Once they understand the core of our work and understand some of the terminology we use, but really just understand their own nervous system, their own mindset, um, and their, their embodiment a little better, and then we take them into more advanced work where we offer week-long courses, we offer six-month-long courses, we have specialty courses that are weekend, a weekend long, like three days long, and then specialty courses that are week-longs as well. Um, and then we even have free courses for people that have taken a workshop. Yeah. Once, yeah. once about every six months, we'll do a free something for graduates of any program. Yeah. Cool. Just come down and let's all get together and have a blast together. Yeah. We, we just had one last week, and it's free. And still, even with a lot of a lot of the work that we do, everybody believes in their own their own money stories and reality pretty mm -hmm. hardcore mm -hmm. and uh, until we can spend a, a significant amount of time with a person that doesn't shift usually uh, mm -hmm. some guys really take off right away but a lot of our students they they take a workshop and they're just like oh you know because we, we want them to expand so quickly and they're afraid of that expansion that they kind of retract back a little bit and, and get a little afraid so this is why we have these free workshops where we're, we're inviting back our star, star students who are really taking the work that we do seriously and just creating amazing results in their lives. And they come in and teach from their perspective, not Brian and I are just there for guidance. And the one that we had last week, the students that did show up were like, this is one of the most powerful experiences that we have had um, because it wasn't us teaching. It was, they could relate from their own perspectives with another student and, and everything that they had gone through and, and understood that, hey, I'm not the only one feeling this. I'm not the only one that's like, oh, this is terrible. Like, all these successful students have reiterated exactly what Brian and I have said. This is what it's going to take to get to XYZ place. They're coming in and saying, yep, this is my experience. This is what I had to deal with, but now this is where I am. And so that really opened the minds of everyone that was present for that workshop. And uh, those that weren't missed out on an incredible opportunity for coaching, that's for sure. And, uh, and Dave alluded to something in there that I think is important about the way Fearless works. He talked about embodiment. Embodiment is, you've heard of the idea of people being in their head. They're just thinking too much. Mm -hmm. um, 
we can't change our reality. We can't change our beliefs and the way we think about ourselves and even feel. It's really about how you feel. Um, because let's say, for example, you have a belief that I, I fail at everything. Well, that belief has no power if it doesn't have an emotion attached to it. And the emotion would be like, let's say I have some sadness or grief or anger attached to that belief. Well, that emotion is down in the body. It's not in the head where I think. The thinking is me tooling around, distracting myself from the emotion. So we do a lot of embodiment work to get you in touch with the emotion that you don't want to feel in relation to that belief so you can let it go. Because it's really easy to let it go once you're in relationship to it. And, and that's why we get such big changes, uh, or the students get such big changes. It helps them to break free of the bond to that belief. And, and so the belief no longer has any more power over them and set them free. And, uh, and to me, that's one of the big keys, is how do we get you down? It's like getting the safe door open. Because a lot of people, they do a lot of work. They read books, they study, but nothing changes. They, they, it, or it takes a long time to change. And a lot of that has to do with they're not in relationship to the nervous system. And, and so they can do all that work for years, because I did. I didn't understand this. But until they actually open and get into the code inside. It's almost like you have to open the program, it's code behind the scenes, and then and go work it down in there, which is down in the body and the nervous system. You can be tooling around an idea for the rest of your life and changing the way it looks, messing with it, but not much changes in your life. And so we really look at Fearless as the idea that how do we help those people that, that have tried everything and can't seem to get anywhere? And that's where, that's where Fearless was born, because I was one of those people. Mm -hmm. I was frustrated, and I just I was not going to live like that anymore. So I, mm -hmm. I was determined. And so I just really wanted to get that out, because that's what's important. I want people to understand, even if you've been struggling for years, there's always a way. Yeah. There's always a way. You know, you don't, have a, you don't have a burning desire without a way to achieve it. You don't have a question without an answer. Law of polarity, law of polarity it, you know, means you have to have an opposite. So if you have a desire, there's a way to achieve it. Yeah. Well, I know with a lot of people, they grew up and, and they think all that glitters is gold. You know, it's the big car, it's the watch, it's the house, it's the money, money, money. Yeah. And you see a lot of people that really haven't made the money trying to dress the part. They're at the club and the, mm -hmm. the financed car and the, you know, the, the, the spiffy suit and jewelry and whatever. But then you, you talk about the really, truly successful wealthy people. We're talking about Richard Branson or, you know, Bill Gates or, you know, Zuckerberg or uh, Warren Buffett or, you know, people that have really, really made it. And they have no air of that trying to prove to someone that, mm -hmm. you know, that they're the, yeah. you know, the dapper one. You know, I always say the billionaire is the guy you'd pass on the street and not even know. Yeah. The yeah. guy who's trying to look like a millionaire is probably working the nine to five and can barely pay his bill. I think Mark Zuckerberg just wears t-shirts and jeans, right? He yeah. Dresses super basic. Yeah, Jimmy Ivey and all these guys, yeah. you know. What 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 is it about that that people have to realize that it's that quiet confidence that when you're successful, you don't really have to show it. It's more inside. Yeah, it's uh, there's they, they, there's a a need for security innate in in human beings, and. And whatever you focus on expands, right? So, for example, if I'm worried about, if I have a need for security, and that's innate in most human beings, then I'm going to create situations in my life by worrying, do I have enough food? Do I have enough money? Do I have enough money in the bank? Do I have enough for retirement? All those worries, even if they are just down in the unconscious, buried deep down, are going to have to manifest somewhere in your life. Just like the need for love, the need for self-esteem. Those are the three main needs we have. And, um, and so until you pull that need for security, really get those deepest worries and thoughts out, money will always have some level or abundance will always have some level of a challenge. We can push ourselves really hard past the need for security and rise way up, make a bunch of money. But when you hit that number, let's say it's a million dollars, and you're like, oh, shit, I made it. I got to where I achieved that need is still down there and it'll be running in the background and now you'll be worrying about protecting it, keeping it. And that's when you get these people that 
worry, 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 and then crash because of that worry gets louder when they achieve their goal. Now I really have to protect it, and then they lose it, and then they go back up. And then because now they start state pumping again, they pump, push, push, push back up, then they worry, worry about keeping it, crash, crash, back down. So until you pull that need, that part of you that's constantly worrying about protecting your money, you won't do, the, you'll make bad decisions. Your unconscious will guide you into decisions that most match the way you think deep down inside, not consciously, deep down inside. Now, once you pull it and you feel really secure, because when, when you pull the need for security out, you're gonna feel really secure around money. You're gonna enjoy it, you're gonna appreciate it, you're gonna have appreciation, curiosity, uh, uh, for what money can do, not just for you, but for other people, how it can help people, it can feed somebody, it can take care of people. And in that, if that's your dominant thinking, then abundance won't be a problem anymore. It, it'll, you'll almost seem lucky to the rest of the world. And the rest of the world will be amazed at how, wow, he starts a business that seems to work. I don't get it. I start a business and it fails. And I know 10 times more than him. I think it was uh, T. Harv Ecker used to say that these people would come in and have all this knowledge, MBAs, and they can't, and everything they do fails. And somebody else will come in, and I'll teach them a few things. They go out and try it, and boom, they're right to the top, and it blows my mind. And so the first time I saw that for real was a friend of mine. He was actually uh, fairly abundant as he when I met him. He was making about fifteen thousand a month, and with him working, you know, normal hours, he wasn't killing himself, and and I was always impressed by that. And then. He did some more work on his unconscious around money, decided to start a business, and he literally went inside a couple months, two to three months, from 15000 a month to over 100000 a month in income. And I sat there and watched this happen, and I would go over and look at what he was doing, and he still wasn't killing himself. Started some online businesses, did this, and I'm like, you went into this online industry and made all this money with no prior knowledge, and it was like easy for you, and I, I struggled, and I watched all these other people struggle, and it's because he didn't have the, that part of him that had this need for security in there. Mm -hmm. It was already pulled. And so he just said, I'm gonna expand this reality around money, and he did. And, and it came from a beautiful place, because he wasn't trying to do it to take from others, because he would literally take 10 and sometimes more than that percent of his income and give it to churches every month. I'd watch him do that. He'd, he'd take cash down, uh, $10,000 to give it to a church. He wanted to go live near his son. He had a really young son, and, and he was and the, the son and his mother moved to another state, so he moved to the other state, bought a big house, wanted to have everything for his son, so his son had the best education. You know, it was all about, it was, you know, it was about him really using that money to better the world, too. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what he was focused on not on how do I hoard it, how do I keep it. Yeah. And we see all these rich guys give their wealth yes. away, and there's far less rich people that have all these cars that they don't drive or homes. How many homes can you live in at any one time? Yeah, it's ridiculous. And, you know, the, the facade, you know. But I know also is that inner strength. If you love what you do and find a way to you know, survive and succeed at what you love to do, then it's not really work. And in so many of our industries, super competitive industries, it's the perseverance. Again, we talked about the tortoise and the hare story. Yes. It's loving what you do, it's methodically keep moving, as opposed to the hare who's all frustrated, like, yeah. you know, why haven't I made it? Why, why, why? Push, 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 push. Yeah, they're, they're, they're pushing and um, nothing's happening for them. You can see the frustration when they walk in a room, like, Somebody owes them something, you know. <laughs> Nobody owes anything. It's it's what you make. And we were talking about L.A. being such a great source of entrepreneurism because, you know, there's a lot of industries that, that obviously emanate from here. And if you come in with good skills and good ideas and a good product or service, you stand a really good chance of making it happen if you've got the right frame of mind and the perseverance. Yeah, it's, it's, it's powerful. One of my mentors once said to me, show up, play by the rules, demonstrate that you can play by the rules, be solid at it, and then when everybody respects you because you did a great job, you can make the rules. You know, be a leader, show up, bring ideas, be innovative, but don't... What well, so many young people that push try to do is come in and try to take over when they haven't earned respect yet. Yeah. 
and then everybody's like, no, no, get out of here. Yeah, you have to be able to do all that, and then then break the rules, mm, and yeah. then make the rules. And that that's something I learned when I was young. It's like, okay, these are the rules. Okay, how do I bend them the way that suit me the best? Mm -hmm. You know, how do, yeah. or how do I just break them and reconstruct that reality for myself? Like, well, that was never really a rule because I just believed that it was. But now that I've deconstructed that rule and put my own rule in place, that okay, cool. Here's a new reality. That that rule truly doesn't exist anymore. And I see so many people get caught up in that. And, you know, on a metaphysical level, which we're not going to go down that rabbit hole right now, but... <laughs> and I want to say he can do that because he earns people's respect. Yeah. You know, they, they may not always love how he's being, but they respect him. And so that allows him to change the rules. Versus these young guys who come in <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. just start moving things around. and no, They haven't earned that right. No, no, no you're, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, uh, the thing is, is that we're, we're creating our lives every day, every second, and as long as we believe that we're doing that and that we're in control, mm -hmm. and, and we're so grounded and rooted and in alignment with our beliefs of what is possible, then you can do whatever you want. There's, there's so many things that I do every day that I watch people follow the rules and I go and I do whatever I want. People are like, oh, okay, cool. Uh, because that's what I believe for me, that this is the way my reality works. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really important for people to understand that, that they can do that themselves. Uh, not in a malicious way or a hateful or hurtful way, but what benefits you to get where you want to go and live the life that you want to live in the best healthy way possible. Again, I'm not saying to do any of this kind of stuff in, in a bad way, because that's just going to go really bad. Um, just to kind of touch on, you know, the money thing that, that Brian was talking about, in safety and security, uh, we talk about this a lot in, in our work, is we talk about the middle class. That's a huge, huge topic in the U.S., mm -hmm. for sure. Um, middle class is very safe. And very secure and the mindset around living that lifestyle is protect secure there's limited abundance and um, as long as we're in this little bubble of safety we're, we're good but and we're only going to try to punch outside of that box just a little bit to gain greater success but not really risk it all now you take um, some uh, Someone that comes from a very impoverished upbringing. You know, look at Howard Schultz. Look at uh, Damon Johns. Uh, those those two guys alone. Like I've read a lot about them, so that's why I bring them mm -hmm. up. You know, Howard Schultz is running Starbucks. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know Damon Johns is running Fubo and Shark Tank. All that. Those, both of those guys came from absolutely nothing. And when you start at the bottom, what do you have to lose? You can't go anywhere other than up. So these guys rose to very powerful positions because they never were brought up or raised in anything safe or comfortable. So that's the problem with the middle class. They're afraid to take those risks because they don't want to go down to where they've never been. They only want to go up. And now it can be done, mm -hmm. but you have to be willing to surrender all of that safety and fall all the way to the bottom to get all the way.